Welcome aboard, shipmates. This is Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories, a training program created for the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps by our friends and supporters by the Navy Talent Acquisition Group in Philadelphia. I'm your host, Warrant Officer David Sheets of the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, and I am joined by my all-star crew from the Navy of MC1 Quinlan, who's our PAO, STG1 Lewison, who's our technical support director, and our talent scout from the Naval Sea Cadet Corps, Ensign Pippo. Today's topic, insights and experience while serving in the Navy submarine force. Cadets, get ready. This is going to be really interesting stuff. And we have a super, super special presenter today. It's Captain James Christie, United States Navy retired. His name may sound familiar to most of you. He is actually our national headquarters representative for the Northwest region of the Naval Sea Cadet Corps. So not only did he serve in the Navy, he's also helping us out in the Sea Cadet Corps. So fantastic. So cadets, just remember, we're live once a week now on Wednesdays. You should know because you're here. And since we're live, and for those of you joining us live, remember when you have questions, and I hope you have plenty of them, put them in the comments section of the YouTube feed. I'll read them out to Captain Christie, and we'll get your questions answered as we move along the way. For those of you who are watching this in recorded mode, okay, leave your questions in the comments section, and we'll also respond to those as well. We do monitor that, so ask away. We'll get you the answers that you're looking for. Finally, as you know, with every episode, we have an online quiz. We will post the URL to the online quiz as soon as we're done. So wait for it. It's coming. So take that online quiz. Get that two hours of virtual drill credit. But I do warn you again, take your time. Fill out your email address correctly. And when you do, you'll get your response. So enough of that housekeeping. Let's move forward. Captain Christie, this ship is all yours, sir. Well, well, thank you, uh, Warrant Officer Sheets. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. And uh, thank you to the rest of the crew uh, uh, for putting all this on, uh, especially you and, and uh, MC1 Clinton and um, uh, STG1 Lewis. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, I've, I've watched many of the um, little YouTube uh, uh, presentations getting ready for mine. And I, I just what an amazing, amazing thing you guys are doing here. So thank you for that. Uh, and so yes, I am. I am uh, uh, James Christie, uh, uh, United States Navy retired captain, and um, uh, I'm really excited to be here. I've been a sea cadet for about a year and a half, almost two years. I've I've been in this in this position that I'm in right now, and before that, uh, I was in the Scorpion Squadron, which is out of Bangor, Washington, and I was uh, participated with that squadron while my son, who was a sea cadet. And we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go on. But uh, I, I enjoyed the Sea Cadet so much that when I retired from the Navy, I uh, waited uh, to see if I could get this job. And this, I was so excited because I just I love working with you all. Uh, just a great bunch of folks here. So without any further ado, we'll start. Uh, let me get my brief up here and we'll start moving along. Okay. All right. So that's me. Uh, we're still, so, Captain Christie, we're not looking at the PowerPoint at this moment. Oh, and yes, you know, we'll always have a challenge getting things together. So that's validation that we are live. <laughs> we certainly are. Certainly. Okay. There we go. There we go. And okay. We full screen, perfect. <laughs> Carry on, sir. All right. So, uh, Captain James Christie and. Uh, this is the submarine force. I, I wanted to give you all a, a brief introduction. Uh, what, what I intend to talk about today is a little bit about myself so you guys understand where I came from and that way you can better answer some, you know, ask some questions. And then I will, we'll talk a little bit about the submarine force. Okay, so without, let's get moving on here. All right, so first me, uh, I currently live up in Paulsbo, Washington, which is where I retired from the Navy. I spent 30 years in the Navy and two years in the Army. Uh, why I joined? I joined because I wanted nuclear power training. I wanted to drive submarines. It was back in the mid 80s and the Cold War was going on strong with the Soviet Union. And I had uh, 
it, it was an interesting story. I, I wanted to be, originally I wanted to be a, uh, well, let, let me start. When I first started in college, I wanted to be an Air Force fighter pilot. That's all I ever wanted to do ever since I was a little kid. And so I grew up in California and I went to San Diego State University in San Diego. And my first year I was at straight out of high school. I went there and I was a uh, aerospace engineer. And I started taking some Air Force ROTC classes and I was on my way to becoming uh, an Air Force jet fighter jockey. And that all got derailed after about a year because I have uh, bad eyes. And I found out, I went to the doctor and they said, Air Force said, well, you can't be a fighter pilot anymore, but you can do something else. And, you know, you can be a missile silo officer or something like that. And that just didn't apply to me. I just wasn't interested in that. So not knowing what I wanted to do, I was kind of lost. And that's going to happen to many of you as you go along. And you always want to have a backup plan. And so I, not knowing what I wanted to do, because my, my plan A wasn't going to work. So I went with plan B. And I, I did the second favorite, my second, my second passion, uh, which was the Army. And so I joined the Army. And I was very excited about that. I, uh, I joined, I only wanted, I, I still wanted to go to college though. So I joined the Army Reserves. And I wanted, I, I liked medicine, so I became a medic. And so I also, I spent two years in the army and uh, once I, in the army reserves. And once I got back from my initial training, uh, I went straight back to college. Uh, but this time, instead of going to San Diego state, I went to a smaller college up North, which was close to my home at Chico state up by Sacramento. So I went to Chico state and I did, did my two years there and, and I finished up my, my bachelor's degree. And I wanted to, I wanted to join the military, right? Well, I didn't really want Air Force. They had this new thing called GPS, and so they didn't need navigators or anything. So I went to the Navy, and I said, hey, I want to be what they call a Naval Flight Officer, right? And so I went to the recruiter's office, and I walked in the door, and uh, th there was an office there. There's this long hallway, three offices. And the first office there was the Navy Nuclear Power Officer Recruiter. And... Uh, he said, he said, Hey, what can I help you with? And I said, well, I'm looking for the Naval flight officer recruiter. And he says, well, he's right back there down the hall, but why don't you come on down and sit down here and talk to me and tell me what you're looking for. And so I sat down with this fella, uh, Lieutenant Larry Endicott, and he and I had a great discussion about submarines and nuclear power, which was also another passion of mine, nuclear power. And by the time I got out of his office, he handed me a book called the hunt for red October. We talked about the Soviet Union and such, and I couldn't wait. And I had a new passion, and I wanted to be a submariner. I wanted to do what submarines do. And back in the Cold War, they were doing, as they are today, they were doing a lot of cool things, right? Uh, the Cold War was up and running, and uh, we were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the uh, Soviet Union at the time. And so I learned a lot about the Soviet Union, and I became a submariner, and that's what I wanted to do. So uh, as soon as I graduated from from uh, uh, college, I went off and I went to officer candidate school, and then I went to uh, became a submariner. So, so that's I have a question for you in regards to you know what what happened with your your army transition into navy. Okay, so you know you had the two years within the army and you you were doing you know army medic, and that's great. That's absolutely fantastic, right? But then you went back to college. So how did that work? Was it like your you know, almost like an enlistment forgiveness. I mean, I, I'm not really sure how that all happened because, you know, two years isn't a pretty big commitment. And then you were back in school and, you know, how, how did all that go down? Because that's, that's pretty interesting. Warren Officer Sheets, that's a, that's a great question. And, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, my son's doing a very similar thing right now. And that's what a lot of you cadets need to understand as well is, uh, you know, if you want to join the military, whether it's Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines or something, right, but you still want to pursue your college degree, then the reserve programs or the National Guard programs are an outstanding, exceptional way to do that, right? So what I did is, is I did two years at San Diego, and then I took six months off where I went to boot camp and medic school, right? And then I went right back into, right back into college. And, uh, but I was in the army reserve. And so once a month, kind of like sea cadets, I was drilling once a month, I'd go out and I'd play army, which was amazingly, I had a great time. 
Uh, I got to go off and fly in helicopters. I got to go to El Salvador. I got to go to Korea. Uh, I had a great time in the army. Got to see some amazing places and do some amazing things with some wonderful people. And, and that was just to, and you got to get paid too, right? It, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got it. paid. Yep, I got paid, and I got a GI Bill, and I got some other good stuff, uh, and I got a bonus too. So uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, and then during the, during the summers, I would take two weeks and go play army for two weeks. And it was, it was fabulous. So I got to belong to a really cool organization at the same time I was working on my degree, which was uh, for me, that was re really important. That's what I wanted to do. And so I, I'd encourage you cadets to think about doing that. My son's doing a very similar thing right now. He went and after he graduated high school, he went and joined the Marine reserves and he became a tanker. And so now he knows how to drive a tank. And so he does that uh, on the weekends, uh, once one weekend a month, and uh, then he goes to college the rest of the time. And they pay they pay lots of good lots of lots of good money. So great question. And and then the nice thing about it is the the reserves they don't they don't they don't want to hold on to you if you want to go and join another unit if you want to join you know Air Force or the Navy or something like that the reserves are okay with that and they'll let you go. So that's that's the other nice thing about it. So. Okay. Okay. And what was your degree in, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I, well, I started off in aerospace engineering and then I, uh, I uh, uh, finished up with chemical engineering. So uh, oh, right. uh, it, 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 I couldn't get any, I, I just wanted to graduate as soon as I can. And, I, and I've never done anything with chemistry. <laughs> right, right. It was, uh, it was uh, just, just something I could do to get, get on to my next career, or okay. my next step. So, okay. so let's talk about that next step. Yeah. So off, off I went. Uh, and uh, the next step was, was Navy. And so I, I would say the best things uh, about my job, uh, and this is, I, I want to put this out up front, is, is the people. The people are absolutely amazing, right? Uh, and this is, this is important to understand, right? I've worked with some of the most um, advanced technologies out there on the ballistic missile submarines, on the fast attack submarines, the guided missile submarines, nuclear reactors, brand new nuclear reactors. I've worked with some, some fantastic technical systems, and, and those are nothing compared to um, uh, the people I've worked with. So I've really, really enjoyed the people I work with. Um, just amazing. And that, that's the best part of my job, was working with some amazing people. I really enjoyed standing watch. Um, you would stand, you know, when I first qualified on the, the reactor, and there I was, you know, 24 years old in the back of the submarine uh, running that entire reactor plant being responsible for that. That was a lot of responsibility for a 24 year old, but I really enjoyed it. Um, you really learn about what it means to be a leader when, when you're a submarine officer, because you're 24 years old, you're in charge of that reactor and you've got eight or nine or 10 people back there. And every single one of those people back there in the engine room, you know, especially when you first start out, they all know a lot more than you know, yet you're in charge of them. So you have to learn how to lead people who know a lot more than you do. And that's that's not an easy thing, right? So you got to learn. You learn right away how to treat people with respect and how to treat them right. And that's one of the the, the things I really enjoyed about the submarine force. Um, I, I really loved driving submarines. My my deep my uh, recruiter told me he said, uh, you know, it's it's not easy to get into the the program. You got to have good grades and such. And uh, he told me he said, uh, you know, we don't let just anybody drive a nuclear powered submarine into Tokyo Bay. And I thought, wow. I'd, I want to do that, you know, so uh, I really enjoyed driving submarines. Um, I enjoyed the missions, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about the missions in here in a little bit, but the missions were just amazing. You know, back in the Cold War days, you know, um, I, I can't give you specifics or anything about what I did, but what the, what the United States Navy did, the submarine forces, they were out there keeping track of the Soviet Union submarines right? And the, the Russian submarines. So we knew where they were, what they were doing, and we were keeping track of them. We were, we were, had a much more capable force than they did. And so we were able to trail them and follow them all around the world and make sure that they weren't doing anything crazy. So I, I thought that was just the neatest thing in the world would be to go out there and out in the middle of the ocean and trail a Soviet submarine without them knowing you're there. So that was one of the most exciting things that I, that one of the things I want to do. I, I love the deployments, you know, deploying for, uh, whether it was a week or six months or eight months, uh, going to different places. We went to many different uh, nations across the, I, I only did Pacific deployments. 
Um, but we went to, uh, you know, all kinds, all the, all the places out there. And I just love doing that. Um, and I love going to sea. Uh, going to sea is wonderful because you, uh, you wake up in the morning and you don't have to get in your car. You don't have to find a parking spot. You don't have to worry about cooking breakfast. You don't have to worry about making coffee. All you do is you get up, you put on your suit, your poopy suit, and off to work you go. And it's, it's wonderful. Food's right there. The coffee's right there. And everybody's happy to see you. So it, it, really, is, it really is an amazing thing. So uh, let's see. My top memory, my favorite memory, uh, would be uh, like we talked about was many of the submarine missions. And we'll talk more about those here in a little bit. And uh, again, visiting foreign ports with my, my shipmates. That uh, the submarine force, it's, it's a very small community. It's, um, it, uh, let's see, it's uh, only, you know, on a submarine, there's only about 120, 130 people, right? And you get to know them very well. So um, that's, uh, and, and, and you're, you're friends with all of them and, and going to a foreign port, it's just a lot of fun. So uh, my previous assignments, I was on five different submarines, six different shore commands, and you can see them all right there. Um, most of my, three of my submarines were out of, uh, Hawaii and two of them were out of, uh, Bangor where I'm at right now. And then I had uh, six shore commands, two of them were out, three of them were out of Hawaii. And then the rest were out of here, out of Bangor. Um, I did deploy, uh, to Djibouti and Bahrain and a little time in Afghanistan. And, uh, I ended up my career in the, um, in the shipyard here at Bangor. And I enjoyed that. I spent uh, six years in the shipyard. And my job then was to um, help the uh, ships come out of the shipyard. When a ship, when a submarine goes into the shipyard for a refueling, they replace the fuel or something or a major maintenance period, it takes them about two years to, to complete that work. And when they come out of the shipyard, it's, it's very difficult because they've been in the shipyard for so long. And so they have to have somewhere there to help them along. And that was my job was to help these submarine crews get out of the shipyard. And so I really enjoyed, again, I just love the people on there and I loved helping them out. So uh, that, was my, that was my Navy career in a nutshell. And we'll talk some more about that. But before we leave this slide here, uh, it's important for you all to know that whether you're in the Navy or the Air Force or the Army or the Marines or the Coast Guard or whatever, if you, if you choose that path, that family is very important to all the services. And I, I have a family. Um, I met my wife in, in Hawaii and we have two kids. Uh, I've got a, one of them's a girl, she's a senior and she's heading off to school next year. And then my son, who, uh, like we said, he's a Marine reservist, a Marine Corps, and, uh, he's going to uh, school, university of North Dakota, and he wants to be a aviator. He wants to, he wants to fly air force jets. And he was a, uh, cadet sea cadet as well. So he, um, he spent four years in the sea cadets. And, and let me tell you a little bit about that is that really, really helped him when the going got tough. Right. Um, and what I, what I mean is, um, he was, he was attending a school in central Washington, an aviation school, and he was, his Marine tank unit was there in Washington as well. Uh, many of you may know the Marines decided to get rid of their tanks this year. All Marine tanks are going away. And, uh, so he didn't have a unit anymore. And at the same time, he, uh, his school suspended his aviation program, so he didn't have a school anymore. So what he uh, was able to do is he was able to apply to several other schools across the nation, some really fine schools. And since he had been a sea cadet and since he had been in the Marines, he had a very easy time of getting into some of these very prestigious schools, right? He was able to get letters of recommendations from his former commanding officers. He uh, had all the great uh, leadership skills from the sea cadets. And the sea cadets really helped him out and really uh, gave him a step up, a leg up on all the other uh, people. Because it's a competitive world out there. And it was the sea cadets that helped him, uh, you know, get where he is today. Um, and, sir, I would uh, like to, I'd like to reinforce that as well for the, for the cadets. I, I know myself, you know, as a commanding officer, we end up writing a lot of recommendation letters for our cadets. We, um, you know, we respond to a whole bunch of you know, questions from different uh, educational locations. We go with them to different interviews through recruiters and things like that. So, you know, cadets, the, the fact that you're part of this, it's bigger than some of the things that you do at any given time and the networking that you get and the skills that you get, just being part of this program really benefits you moving forward. So at any time as you're going through this program thinking, well, you know, it's not exactly 
what I'm looking for. Stop back, give yourself a, a, a gut check and go, what's the big picture? What am I really looking for? And your experience here, just having that leadership experience, because that's what universities look for, they are far more interested in someone that was a leading petty officer in the Sea Cadet Corps than someone who is the secret, uh, say, the second secretary of the chess club in high school. I mean, it doesn't even compare. So that opening is huge for you just because you do that. So keep that in mind. What Captain Christie is saying is 100% spot on. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and not only that, whether you choose the military, and I don't care whether you choose the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, or even the Space Force now, don't forget them, right? The mil It's going to help you out. But it, even it, whether you're officer or enlisted. But let's say, for example, you decide you don't want to be in the military. That's fine, too. Let's say you want to go do a trade school. You want to go to a college or something like that. Whatever you choose to do down in the future, this is going to help you right now. So excellent. Okay. Uh, oh, and the other thing is just because you're in the military doesn't mean you can't have some fun, right? So I like to, I, my, my hobbies, my passions are mountaineering, uh, snow skiing, and bike racing. And so those are the things that I've been able to do. And I've been able to do those the whole time I was, was in the Navy. So uh, it's a, you get to have a family and a life and do some really, really cool stuff. Okay. So um, we, we're not going to go over this, but this is just uh this is my uh, official biography, and uh, there it just says, you know, I um, graduated uh, from Chico State, um, and you also have a lot of time. I was able to get three master's degrees because uh, when you're out at sea, you're very busy, but then when you're on shore duty, you know, you have a lot of time, right? And we only work maybe six or five or eight hours a day on shore duty, so every time I went on shore duty, I went and I got a master's degree, right? So I got three of those, and um Let's see. Then it talks about my different submarines, my different shore duties. And then I did I did spend a year uh, after I got out of the Navy, and I spent a year uh, working at the shipyard as a nuclear engineer, which was a lot of fun as well. Again, superstar people there. Just love them. Okay, so now we've got this really cool um, submarine uh, uh, video I'm going to show you. Okay, so... I'm going to start that right now. Uh, I, I think I have to stop sharing first. Okay. That's okay. Again, cadets, this is live. We're proving it. This is not a fancy production model that uh, you see on TV. So take your time. Here we go. Okay. All right, here we go. Definitely have our own language. Have you heard of water slugs? North Atlantic triangle fish, deep red hamsters. One of my favorites will always be Zarf. Oh, Zarf, yeah. Poopy suits. Poopy suits. <laughs> Life on a submarine is uh, you live inside a biodome that's built for sinking. See, some kind of report. It's a normal day for us, so we'll get up and then. Take a shower, get ready, brush your teeth, shave, eat. It's kind of normal stuff you would normally tend to see. But then we work on a rotating eight-hour shift. So we could be on days, we could be on nights, we could be on mids. And then uh, you'll go on and stand your watch. We make our own water. We make our own oxygen. How long we can operate is usually based on how much food we carry. The mission for these submarines is the strongest leg in a nuclear triad, the turrets. The feeding turrets is the easiest thing we do. We're out here to make sure that nobody wants to take on the U.S. You know everybody by the first name. You know everybody's background. It's a it's a small, tight-knit family. I've been lucky to have some great COs and be on some great boats and serve with some really awesome people. There are things that, I, that, that I've done at sea or on a submarine that I'll never forget. And there are people that I've met that I'll never forget. And without submarines or the Navy, I would have never had the opportunity. Being able to have a job like this and being in a place that I am, it's a huge honor. I, uh, I enjoy what I do, and serving our country is what's what's put me where I'm at, so I'm very proud of that. Oh, and of course, it's the best part of the Navy. There's a lot of communities that think they're the best, but they've never been on a submarine, so I think they've changed their mind. 
I, I really like that one line that one of the sailors was saying is that we're on a, a, a biosphere, which is designed to sink. <laughs> <laughs> I, never really, I never really heard a submarine described like that. And then cadets, those of you who have been watched quite a few of our episodes, we've had representation from many rates uh, associated with the submarine force uh, on the enlisted side, clearly. And, you know, everyone is so incredibly uh, knowledgeable and professional and all that great stuff. So, I, I mean, Captain Christie, although, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an aviation type, right? And the thought of actually going on a submarine is very foreign to me. It really sounds like a heck of a good time and very demanding. So uh, I applaud you for that choice. <laughs> well, well, thanks, uh, uh, one-off sheets. I appreciate that. So um, I actually spent um, – probably about three or four hours uh, going through the YouTube or going through the, uh, the internet looking for submarine um, videos and such. And, and I, I looked at, I looked at hundreds and I picked that one out because that one, for one, it looked really cool. It makes it look cool. Um, which we'll talk about that here in a second, but two more importantly is it showed people and that's what it focused on was the people. Right. And, um, you know, I, I, I just love them. I get a little choked up when I think about the wonderful people that I've worked with on the submarines because they really, really are awesome. You know, there's they're just there's no bullying. There's no rat. It's just there's just a wonderful, wonderful work environment. And I really love it. Right. Um, now, let's let's talk. About, uh, the other thing it shows is, is the submarine force. They were making some big mistakes for a lot of years. Right. And that big mistake was is we weren't allowing females on the submarines. Right. Um, but now we have over the past 10 years, we brought, we brought females in. And so we've opened it up. You know, we used to be limiting ourselves and now we've opened up the aperture. And so we can bring in all this great talent to the submarine force, which we were missing before. Right. Uh, and we have the submarine force needs the best of the best because it, it is one of the most difficult jobs. And so the fact that we were limiting just, just males was wrong. And so now we've got females in there and things are going even better. All right. The other thing about that is it, it no matter how cool that video looked, and you know, you could have had Tom Cruise on there, you could have some really cool music, and it would look even really, really cool. No matter how cool and exciting it looks, it is not nearly as exciting as it is being out there. Being out there is way, way more exciting and way, way cooler. Okay. When you're on the top of a bridge of the submarine that's the sail, and you're driving that thing on the surface, and you're in charge of that thing, it is one of the most awesome feelings in the world. And there is no video that they can produce that just that shows you how awesome that is. So uh, I just want you all to understand that. Okay, so let's get back to my little brief here. So uh, this is what I did in the military. We've talked a lot about this already. Uh, I was an army medic. I did I did the field medic part, which is like what they call a combat medic. And then I was also a, a hospital, like a corpsman medic. So I could set up a I could set up a uh, operating room table or I could, op, you know, I could stop bleeding out uh, from a gunshot wound out in the field. Right. And, and one of the reasons I wanted to run through all this is so that you guys could have an understanding who I am. And so you could ask, you know, questions. All right. Uh, then I became a submarine crewman. Right. I started off as a um, I went there's there's basically uh, we'll talk more about this at the end. But there's three ways you can go. Actually, four ways. Um, I went through officer candidate school. So I graduated. I graduated college, and then I went right away to Officer Candidate School, which was in Newport, Rhode Island. And then I went to Power School, and we'll talk more about that. And then I got um, – those are a lot of the pictures there with, with some of my friends at uh, Officer Candidate School. And then uh, I got to my first submarine, and I was a division officer. So as a division officer, you're typically back in – you start off in the engine room, and uh, there's three different, three different um, divisions back there, right? There's uh, – mechanics who work on big valves and such. There's electricians who work with electricity. And then there's the reactor operators, reactor technicians, and they're the ones who control the reactor. So those are the three different divisions back in the engine room, in the engineering department. And so I started off back there. I was the division officer for the electricians. And I was the division officer. The, the day I stepped aboard that first submarine of mine, the Sam Houston, I was a division officer, right? And so again, I had I ran a, I had a division of about ten or twelve guys 
who knew way more than I did about the division, about the submarine, about the electronics, right? But I was in charge of them. And so that was, that was a difficult position to be in. And I had to learn right away to trust my people, to listen to my people and hear what they had to say, right? And that's what I would do. I'd say, hey, hey, chief, what's going on here? Tell me what, I, what and he'd, he'd explain it to me. And I, okay, got it. What do you want me to do? Got it. And after, after six months or a year, I kind of got the, I kind of got the feel of it and uh, it was a lot of fun. So uh, after a year in the engine room, I uh, moved up front and I was uh, worked for the navigator who was the operations officer and had a lot of fun doing that. Um, and then uh, probably my favorite tour came after my division officer tour. I was a department head, right? So on a submarine, the, the officers, you have the CO, you have the XO, then you have department heads. There's three of them, actually four of them. And then you have the divisions below them. And so my second tour, I was department head. And I really enjoyed that. Um, I was the navigator, and that was probably my favorite tour. And, that, and there's a lot of pictures of me there as a navigator. Um, you know, we went out, and this was uh, during as the Cold War was kind of kind of coming to an end. And uh, we were out there making sure, you know, the Soviet Union was doing what they were saying they were supposed to be doing. And it was, it was a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, executive officer and commanding officer, those two are fun. Um, you really learn about responsibility, what it means to be in charge, and what it means to be responsible for the men on your boat, right? That was a, that's a huge responsibility, right? As as an officer in the military, whether it's on a submarine or the um, an a aviation or whatever, you're you're going to be a, a leader, a manager, right? That's what you're all about, right? And there's a big difference between being a leader and a manager, and you, you you'll learn that. Um, and you're going to be a shipmate, right? You're going to, most importantly, you got to take care of your people. Um, and that is, that is the most important thing. I learned about reactive plant operations. I really, that for me, that was one of the reasons I joined the Navy was because of reactive plant operations. The reason I stayed in the Navy was because it was because of the people. But the, the reason I joined was because I wanted to learn how to operate a reactor. Um, I, I think everybody out there, I don't think, I know everybody out there is good at something right? Um, for me, I was good at running and I was good at uh, math. And that was it. I wasn't good at football or basketball or tennis or speaking, public speaking or any of those other things. I was horrible. I couldn't spell. I was just terrible at that. The one, the two things I could do were run and math. And so uh, I used my math to get in, you know, learn uh, to get good at science and, and those types of things. And that's why I was able to do the reactor plan you know, learn about reactors and things like that. It's a very, very um, academic intensive course of study. So if you want to be a submariner, you got to understand that. It, there's a lot of STEM, a lot of science, technology, math, and engineering. So that, for me, that was, I enjoyed that. It was, it, it was still very hard, but I enjoyed doing that. Um, let's see what I really did. I worked really hard. It was very physically and mentally uh, challenging. A lot of time studying, uh, long work days and be deployed for months. Um, if, if, the, if you're the type of person that doesn't like to study, you know, five, six, eight, 10 hours a day, then the submarine force, especially the officer community is, is not going to be for you. Um, one of the most important things about being a leader in the submarine force is you have to know your systems. You have to, you have to know every single system on that boat from the reactor plant to the torpedoes, to the sonar systems, everything. You've got to understand all of it. So it takes a lot of study. Um, otherwise you've got no business being out there because it's not like working at McDonald's or Safeway or something like that. If you have a problem at McDonald's or Safeway or something, you know, you just call in whoever the fire department or the mechanic or whatever, and they come and they fix it. When you're out there in the middle of the Pacific ocean, if you have a problem, there is nobody out there to help you, but yourself. And so everybody has to understand that and everybody has to pull together. And that was, that's one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much is because we become such great friends out there. OK, uh, we did. I worked a lot of long days and I did a lot of long deployments. But again, I hung out with some of the most awesome people in the world. If I could if I could change, uh, if I could go back in time and change uh, what I did, uh, would I have joined the Navy? Navy? I, I, I would have I wouldn't have changed a thing. I would have, I would have joined the Navy and I'd have gone in the submarine force. I just just most wonderful thing in the world. OK. Uh, and, and it was fortunate. We talked about my bad eyes. I think it was fortunate that I had to have glasses because uh, if I if I had good eyes, I would have become a fighter pilot. And I don't think I would have enjoyed it as much as being a submariner. OK, 
So let's, uh, we're going to shift gears here a little bit uh, and talk a little bit about submarine missions and what it, what it takes to become a submarine officer. Okay. So we, we have several missions, right? Um, we've talked a little bit about the Cold War mission, right? Where we were kind of watching what the Soviets were doing and they were kind of watching what we were doing. Uh, it was a very exciting time. Uh, some of our other missions are anti-surface warfare, right? So we have to keep the sea lanes of communication open, right? Something around 90 to 95% of the, of the goods that we, that are shipped around the world are shipped via the sea. So the Navy, it's their job to keep those lanes open, right? And uh, throughout the years, World War I, World War II, things like that, other navies, other countries would try to, you know, strangle um, and prevent the, those shipments from happening. And it was our job as a surface fleet, as a submarine forces, was to be able to take out some of those surface ships. And so we became very proficient at that. Uh, there's really only one way to sink a ship, right? And that's with the submarine torpedo. Uh, that brings up an interesting a little story that I wanted to tell you all. Um, often when the Navy gets retires a surface ship, right? When it's, when it's 30 years old, when it's past its prime, it's time for that ship to go out and retire. They decommission that ship, right? And so one of the things they do with that ship is they do what they call a sink X. That's called the sink exercise. And so they'll, they'll take that ship out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean and they're going to sink it, right? And they're going to practice with all their different toys and sink it. And so on the first day, it takes three days to do this sink X, right? On the first day, the naval aviators will come and their F-18 jets and things, and they'll drop bombs on this ship, and they'll drop, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, 30 bombs, and they'll, they'll bomb this thing all day, right? And, uh, and it'll get all beat up, and, but it won't sink, right? And then on the second day, the surface guys will come in, right? And they'll shoot their guns at it. They'll shoot their five inch guns at it all day long and they'll poke little holes on it. And, and again, at the end of the day, that ship's looking really bad, but it's still floating, right? And then on the third day, um, a submarine comes in and the submarine comes up to periscope depth. It takes a look, gets the solution down, plots a solution, and then shoots one torpedo. That one torpedo goes over there and it blows up underneath the ship. That's what you can see there in the lower left-hand corner and the ship sinks. One torpedo takes about two minutes, and that ship is done. So if you want to sink a surface ship, the submarine force is the only way to do it, right? And we're very good at it. So cadets, if you've ever seen any of those videos uh, of the sink X, and, and, and thank you, Captain, for bringing that up. I mean, once uh, that torpedo gets right underneath the hull, it just, it just snaps it, right? Yeah. It just cracks in half, and then goodbye, right? So uh, it's not really good for the aviation types and the surface warfare types just to poke holes and to make it look, you know, unsavory. And then along comes like one Mark 46 torpedo and it's gone. So if you don't think that submarines are one of the most lethal, if not the most lethal platform out there, you got another thing coming. And uh, it, it's impressive. It's really impressive. Thanks, Lord Off Sheets. And, and, and I always like to poke fun of my surface my surface and my aviator friends and uh, let them know. But at the end of the day, we're all on the same team and, and they're all just great people as well. Uh, so uh, so that's the surface ship, anti-surface ship mission. Uh, what we're best at as well is the anti-submarine warfare mission, right? And and I could, I could, you know, we're only here for an hour, but I could probably go on all day and sometime next week and tell you stories about how, you know, we've hunted other submarines and trailed other submarines and all that kind of stuff. And then again, I could tell you how I've seen other, the, the surface Navy and the, the aviators, um, you know, try to find the submarines. And, you know, uh, again, if you want to find a submarine, you want to sink a submarine, you need a submarine to do it. Um, so I, I worked with uh, my good friend here, Warren Officer Sheets. He was on a P3. And so he would hunt submarines and we, we, we did some of the same things. But again, at the end of the day, we were all in the business together, right? And, and often we would work together with the, the, the aviation community to help find those, those uh, other submarines that we were looking for from the other different countries. So uh, the other thing we do is strike warfare. That's become very prevalent in the past, uh, you know, since the Cold War has been over. It started in the, uh, the first Gulf War in 1990 and it's continued on today. Uh, we have a strike mission, which means we, uh, we, uh, we launch Tomahawk missiles um, which is right there in the middle, and we launch those in, into uh, onto land targets, right? Uh, we've become very proficient at that as well. Uh, one of our one of our types of submarines, we have four of them. They're called SSGNs. They're submarines, guided missile submarines, 
Uh, they can carry 154 tomahawks, which is more tomahawks than any other platform out there can carry. So um, when they were having some problems out there in the Middle East, the USS Florida, I think, was out there, and they launched several tomahawks into uh, one of the countries out there during uh, back in, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago. Asian Dawn is what it, I think it was with the mission. So, sir, uh, I noticed that one of your submarines was the USS Ohio, which was a converted boomer into a guided missile ship. Were you part of that? I, I was. As a matter of fact, I did. Uh, when you want to speak about destructive power, there is nothing more destructive than a, a Ohio class ballistic missile submarine. That is the most formidable ship out there that is that's ever been out there and ever in the history of the world. The Ohio class submarine is just an amazing platform. Twenty four nuclear tip ballistic missiles um, and that does the strategic mission. And, and that's I think you all understand that the reason we have those is not not to strike another country. But if another country was to strike us, they could take out our bombers and our missiles, right? Our Air Force bombers and our Air Force missiles. But what they could not take out would be our submarines that are out at sea. And so they have to know that if they strike us, that that, that platform, that Ohio class submarine is going to be out there waiting. And that is what has prevented World War III from happening. So I was on the Ohio. I did a strategic mission. It was it was much different than being on a fast attack boat, but it was still a, it, it was very exciting um, to be out there, you know, on call, ready to go, ready to do the, the the president's bidding if he called upon us. I did that. I did one patrol, and then I took that submarine into the shipyard, and we converted that submarine to the SSGN, the one I was talking about, that carries the guided missiles, the the Tomahawk missiles, and the Navy SEALs. Carries up to one hundred. 54 Tomahawk missiles and up to 66 Navy SEALs. And so I did a lot of missions with the Navy SEALs. And that's what that one picture there is. You can see the, uh, the submarine setting off into the background. If you look in the lower right-hand corner of that picture, you can actually see a couple of Navy divers. Those are Navy SEALs that are getting back aboard that submarine. That's, uh, that's one of the SSGNs there. So we have four of them, Ohio, Michigan, Florida, and Georgia. Those were the first uh, four Tridents that we built. And as they got older, we converted them to SSGNs. So. Uh, great question. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. We also do mine warfare. We can uh, plant a minefield uh, if we wanted to choke off a harbor. If we wanted to keep somebody's uh, submarines or surface ships inside the harbor, we could we could mine it. We also do. And here's one of our biggest missions. And that's called ISR: Indications, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. Right. That's all about uh, listening in on our would-be enemies to making sure that we understand what they're doing. And if we have a better understanding of what they're doing. Right, then we can deal with them if war should come. Right, uh, so we know how to deal with them. We know what their strategies are. We know what their tactics are, so we can defeat them. Right, and if they know that we can defeat them, they're going to be much less likely to go to war with us. And that's what this is all about. And that's what I want you all to understand: is the Navy is not there to fight a war. Right, the Navy does not want to fight a war. None of the militaries want to fight a war. We are there strictly to prevent war. Now, if we have to, obviously we can, and we train for that. But that's what's important. If you have a good, strong, trained military force, you're much, much less likely to get into a war, right? And that's what it's all about. So um, that's uh, th those are our submarine missions in a, in a nutshell. Um, and uh, uh, just I enjoy – I did every single one of those. And like I said, that's one of the reasons I stayed in because I just really enjoyed the people. I really enjoyed doing those missions. It was just a wonderful thing. So uh, before I – finished off here, I wanted to talk about what it takes to become a submarine officer, right? Um, that's what I did. And we can also talk about submarine enlisted as well. But uh, the, the enlisted, it, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's, it's not as, it's, it's a little bit simpler, I would say, to become a, a submarine enlisted person. Uh, you have to obviously go to your, your, uh, your talent acquisition person, your recruiter. Uh, you do well on your ASVAB and then you pick your job and then you, you go to boot camp, and then after boot camp, I don't think it's called boot camp, recruit training at the Great Lakes, and then after that, you go to your school, which could be uh, nuclear power school, or it could be, um, you know, me mechanic school, or it could be sonar school, or communication school, or, or whatever the, the chosen path you have, and then after that, then you go to sub school in Groton, Connecticut, and then after that, you go to your submarine, and off you go, All right, and that's open to men and women alike, right? And that's a, that's a great way to start, right? If you want to, if you out of high school, if you want to go right into the Navy, that's a great path, right? If you want to become an officer, 
it's a little bit longer path and it takes, uh, it's, uh, I don't want to say it's any harder or any, it's, it's not any better. It's just different. Okay. Um, and, and if you choose that path, then you, you, you're going to, you're going to have to go to school, right? And you're going to either go to the Naval Academy or you're going to go to school on an ROTC scholarship, or you're going to go to school and graduate and then go to officer candidate school like I did. Right now there's a fourth way, and this is a really, really great way to do it as well. It's called the seaman to admiral program, right? And so if you want to be an officer and you want to be a really, really good officer, right? And you want to be the best officer that you can be, one of the best ways to do that is first you become an enlisted person, right? And that's what I did. I wasn't enlisted in the Navy, but I was enlisted in the Army. And so I started off at the very bottom, right, in the Army, digging foxholes and, you know, doing all those, those hard jobs. And so I know what it was like to start off from the bottom and then work my way up. And so when I became an officer, I knew what those what those uh, enlisted folks were going through. I had a good idea of what they had gone through. And so I was able to able to help them out even more and listen to them and understand their problems. And so in my opinion, some of the best officers out there were prior enlisted people. OK, so that's called the Seaman Admiral Program. So what you do to get that program is you enlist in the Navy. You do a couple of years, you do well and then you apply. And then if you get accepted, then you get to go off to college for three years. And the Navy pays for it. They pay for your college and they pay for your living expenses. They pay for everything. It's one of the most fantastic deals out there. And at the end of those three years, you got to go to full time. But at the end of those three years, you get your degree and you become an officer, whether it's a nuclear powered officer or an aviation officer or whatever you wanted to do. Great, great way. But anyway, back to submarine officers. So you, you go to OCS, Naval Academy or ROTC. And then when you graduate those, right, um, and here's another important thing to understand, whether it's OCS, Naval Academy or ROTC, they're all the same. You come out of there, you're all ensigns. Nobody cares what you went to, right? The officer candidate officer ensign is the same as the Naval Academy ensign, who's the same as the ROTC ensign. They're all the same. Nobody cares about where you came from. The only thing they care about is what you're going to do and how hard you work. Okay. So anyway, you come out of the, your, your, your school and you go off to nuclear power school. Okay, and so nuclear power school is six months. That was the most of six months of chemistry, physics, math, reactor engineering, uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. That was the most intensive six months I'd ever had. Very, very hard. So if you don't want to, if, if that's not your cup of tea, then steer away from that, right? Because it takes real dedication. And after six months of that, then you go to six months of prototype. And that's where you actually, for the first time, you get to put your hands on and work on an actual naval reactor okay and you get to uh operate it start it up shut it down do all kinds of great stuff so um i really really uh enjoyed prototype because for the first time i got to start up a reactor and the first time you take a reactor critical let me tell you that's some exciting stuff okay then after prototype so that takes six months there at pro school six months of prototype um and then you're out to sub school which is i think three months long and then you end up on your first you're at your first boat. And we kind of talked a little bit about that already. Um, and then you're on your first boat. Uh, one of the most, the first year is not, is not an easy year because again, you got to go and you got to qualify everything. You got to learn how to run that reactor. You got to qualify that. You got to learn how to drive the submarine, both on the surface and on the, on the surf, on the submerged, submerged and on the surface. You got to learn how to talk on the radio, how to, um, you know, figure out how to do battle group operations, do all these kinds of things, right? And then you become qualified off the deck. And then is when you get to drive your submarine for the first time. That's that's all by yourself. It's an amazing, amazing feeling. Uh, and and uh, uh, after after a couple of years, there is nobody that knows more about that submarine than you do. And so the captain comes and starts asking you questions. The enlisted folks ask you questions. You become the expert on that boat. And it's a wonderful, wonderful time. That's really great. Yeah. That is really great. Thank you for describing that uh, training pipeline. Because it's important to know what you're in for, right? And uh, it's pretty intense academically, but it sounds to me, you know, 100% worth it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, uh, with that, uh, yes. uh, that was what I had planned on talking about. Hopefully, I didn't take too long. There. No, uh, you're you're right on time. And there's a couple really good questions from the cadets. So, cadets, uh, again, thank you very much for posting your questions. Um, Captain Christie does an excellent job of really framing a lot of it. So some of the questions you are asking were being answered in the midst of his conversation. So if we don't get to them, please don't take it personally. It's not a big deal. 
Also, again, I wanna reinforce to those who are watching the recorded view uh, of this, put your questions within the comment section uh, of the uh, archived version on the YouTube channel and we'll get back to you. I'm sure uh, Captain Chris, you will be watching that and he'll be responding as well. So uh, just because you're not doing it live doesn't mean that you can't get your questions asked and answered. So one of the questions uh, is, you know, so since you're underwater for such a significant amount of time without surfacing, do you ever get seasick? <laughs> That's a great question. And so I did get seasick. And as a matter of fact, um, we used to take these uh, pills and uh, we had these I, all kinds of things. But the only time I would get seasick was when we left, when we got underway. Right. And so there you are sitting at the pier and um, when you're at the pier, everything's nice and smooth. And then you get underway and you're in the channel. Right. And you're in this protected channel at first and everything's nice and smooth. But once you get outside the channel and you're in the open ocean, then there's some big waves. Right. And before you submerge, those waves are knocking the ship and the ship's going up and down and left and right. And oh, yeah, I got I got sick. I got I threw up. I got headaches. It was just awful. And so one of the things that I would do as I got more senior is I would always make sure that we when we were on the surface, that I was the guy up on the bridge driving the submarine because that way I wouldn't get sick up there. So I spent a lot of time driving the submarines out of harbors. Uh, one, <laughs> you were you were pretty pretty much doing it for personal selfish reasons, so it appears. <laughs> yeah. and, and don't feel bad because I, you know through a lot of the uh, interest that I have in space exploration, almost all the Apollo astronauts on the way to the moon were throwing up in the capsule. So being you know seasick, space sick, that's you know that's just a badge of courage. It it is, but the beauty of a submarine though is if I was on a surface ship, then I'd continue to be sick like for the rest of the deployment. But on a submarine, you dive that boat. And once you dive that boat, it is the most awesome feeling in the world. All of a sudden it's quiet, things are you know peaceful, you can't hear anything, it's just absolutely amazing. Um, you hear the, the slow drown of the fan in the background or you smell the bacon cooking or whatever. And it's just most wonderful. I've whoa, never- whoa, whoa, whoa. They have bacon? <laughs> oh yeah it was the wrong field that's awesome <laughs> they've got some of the most amazing food down there um but once you get submerged there's no more seasickness it's uh it's just wonderful as a matter of fact i've never slept as well as i've slept on board of submarines right it's just you're, you're slowly rocked to sleep it's just an amazing amazing feeling so great question okay so a similar question that just came in from one of our fellow sea cadet officers is do you ever actually get your sea legs when you're on the surface or you just keep praying and i'm paraphrasing now that you go submerged and it just the nightmare's over no i the, the nightmare lasted for 30 years <laughs> I, never, I never got my sea legs <laughs> so okay. i uh, i um I, I did i did a lot of different things i took a lot of different pills uh you know seasickness pills and things like that and for me unfortunately i never ever got my legs um it was uh there was one time when we took a I was on a really old submarine and we um, we drove it from from Hawaii to, to across the Pacific Ocean over to Bangor, Washington on the surface the entire way during the winter. And uh, our tilt meter which was a little string that we had taped to the side of the wall with a little So cadets, I don't know if we're still live. It looks like Captain Christie's display has been frozen. MC1, are you seeing us? Uh, yes, sir. Unfortunately, he is frozen for us. Okay. Well, we were getting into some really good conversations here. Um, Maybe, maybe his uh, Wi-Fi will come back in a few moments. But, you know, cadets, you're asking some really, really great questions um, in regards to what life is like on the submarine. Uh, one of the questions that came across uh, was, you know, how deep can the submarine go and, and what, you know, what type of pressure is on the hull in relationship to that? One thing to really understand in regards to, you know, what we call the silent service is the vast majority of this stuff is highly classified. And that's for a good reason. It's, you know, it's for you to get your tactical advantage and for be able to provide 
the information about depths and speeds and things like that, um, you know, it help it you know kind of helps the adversaries in regards to figuring out what the capabilities are. And when that is the case, unfortunately, uh, things get compromised. There have been in the past some instances um, where people in very high positions uh, within the submarine community uh, have disclosed uh, classified information and it is quite devastating. So one thing to think about cadets when you're given a position of trust, not just in the Navy, but anywhere else, right? You know that position of trust really means something. And to violate that position of trust can have absolutely disastrous consequences. So, you know, again, you're given that responsibility, you have the background, you're checked, you make sure that it's fine. But those are the types of questions and activities that you have to keep to yourself. So Captain Christie was talking about some of the missions that he was running. Oh, it looks like he's coming back. That's great. So Captain Christie was talking about some of the missions that he was part of where he's saying, well, you know, I can't really discuss that, right? Even though it's been years ago, right? To get very, very specific about that, you just can't do that due to, you, know, you never know, you know, what's being leaked. You never know, you know, what's being compromised. And it's very important to keep that to yourself. So, you know, that expression, Loose slips sink ships. Say that ten times fast, right? That's a real thing. And and um, the, our folks who serve in the submarine forces have some of the highest security accesses that you could possibly imagine, and they have to keep that. Sorry to the grave. It's not like oh well, I trust you, and you you you, you, I'll, you won't say anything, will you? Right. So once you enter this field and any of these fields that have security clearance backgrounds, it is very important to know that you're being trusted for life, right? So Captain Christie, while your internet was uh, playing games with you, one of the questions that I was discussing was, you know, what are the depths that the submarines can go to? And, oh, the, yeah. and that's that's what we were talking about. Like, you know, hey, classified's classified. And yeah. that's okay, right? So that's kind of the way things go. So I'm, I'm glad that you're back. We have a few more minutes and a couple of good questions. So stand by, here we go. And I did promise you that since this is live, things are going to go wrong, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, my so, I'm on my hotspot now, so hopefully my uh, hopefully okay. that'll work. Okay, fair enough. Um, one of the other questions is okay. So if you were not in the submarine force in the Navy, would there be another job you would have been interested in? Well, yes, yes. That's a oh boy, that's a great question. I, I don't know where these cadets are coming from. You guys are amazing, um, and thank you for asking that. Uh, I yes. First, I told you I wanted to be a jet fighter jockey, but what I really wanted to be was an astronaut, right? So that, that's what I wanted. Um, but as I as I continued my college career, right, uh, I came to a I came to a crossroads, and one of the crossroads was you know Navy, you know nuclear power, submarines, naval flight officer. That was one of the that's the path I chose. But the other path, which was just as likely, was I wanted to go. I wanted to go army. I wanted to go airborne ranger. I wanted to go, you know, um, ranger. And, and as far as I could go along that path, I, like I said, I, I was a big, uh, big time mountain climber and I love backpacking. I love being out in the woods and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the army really appealed to me. Uh, I, I wanted to jump out of airplanes and I, you know, I'd gone parachuting before and I loved it. I wanted to be an army ranger and, you know, potentially green beret or whatever that way it would go. And so I was very interested in that as well. Um, I, 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 I chose, I, I, what I did is I, I made a list of the advantages and disadvantages of both. And the thing that drove me towards the Navy instead of the army was because at the time the army was a garrison force in Germany and their job was to stop the Russians. If they came pouring through the Soviets, if they came pouring through the full, the gap, Right. And I hadn't been in the army. I knew this. And what they told me is they, you know, if the, if the Russians, if the Soviet Union starts coming through, you know, and we're in Germany, which is where I was supposed to be deployed to, then they, they told us to dig a foxhole. Right. You dig that foxhole. Foxhole right before the missiles come and you cover yourself with the, your, your poncho and then the bombs, the nuclear bombs would come. They blow up. And, and those of us who survived, we were supposed to jump out of our poncho, that poncho put it on and then charge as fast as we could at the enemy because we only had two or three days to live before we die from radiation poisoning. So that, to me, didn't sound very exciting. 
So, but the Navy, like I said, they were doing some great things. They were chasing the Soviet Union. They were chasing the submarines. They were having all kinds of fun. And so that's why, that's why I ultimately made the decision. And I, some days I, I, I wonder what it would have been like had I joined the Army because shortly after I joined the Navy, obviously the Gulf War happened and things like that. I would have had a much, much different life. I, I would have been in the Middle East much, much more. Um, I did get a chance to go over there in Afghanistan, and I, again, enjoyed that very much. Some great Army people over there. Um, but, um, yeah, so great question. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I think the fact that you were, tr you know, selling it by I'm digging a hole, I'm waiting for the nuclear bombs to hit, and then those of us who survive can. Um, <laughs> probably not in the Army recruiting brochure. No, it wasn't. I'm, kinda, I'm thinking no. I'm thinking no. no. It's a lot different now, though. I'm sure the Army would tell you a different story now, and I love the Army. Army's great folks, too. So Yes, um, yes. you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So, you know, just to, to wrap up our presentation today, and, and again, uh, Captain Christie, I can't thank you enough for, for being part of our uh, telecast. Um, hopefully, cadets, you, you've gotten a whole lot out of this. It's great to, you know, have his experience and brought forward and, and another angle of the submarine force, because we do talk about the submarine force frequently within this uh you know, the, these episodes. And it's because it is so interesting and it is because it is so, you know, demanding and, uh, you know, a, a great, you know, path that that's where you want to go. So, you know, thank you very much for giving us your insight to that. Uh, but I do want to end our presentation with the same really insightful question that every one of our uh, presenters has had to deal with. Okay, and this is the favorite question coming from the cadets, and they seem to try to compete with each other. The first one to ask it within the chat window. Okay, so okay. here you go. All right, so if you were to describe the Navy with just one word, what would that word be? Just one word, and why? Oh, just one word. What would that? That's a that's a great question. I can I have two? No, you just have one word. Although we've had presenters try to cheat a little bit by having a hyphenated thing, but no, you just have one word. See if you can stick to that, sir. Well, I, I'm big about acronyms. Can I give you one acronym? You know, I, I would be forced as a warrant officer to argue with the captain. <laughs> no, I'm not good. No. <laughs> I would say something about, no, that one, that's, that's easy. There's, there's nothing wrong. There is, there is, that is the easiest, easiest question you've ever asked. And, I can only answer this now. I mean, maybe 30 years ago, I would have given you, I would have said, you know, I would have said, I don't know, money, career, job, awesome, amazing, something. But no, none of that, none of that matters. There's only one thing about the Navy, just one thing and one thing only, and that's people, right? That's the only thing that matters, people, right? And uh, uh, I tell you, um, I mean, you could say adventure, you can say, you know, awesome I was going to say awesome people, but people, people is all that matters. And uh, you will meet some of your best friends, lifelong friends in the Navy. Um, and and the, the thing is, is and you know this, um, uh, you know, um, you may not see them, you know, for 10, 15, 20 years. But when you run into them, it's just like it was before. Right. And, and they're just awesome. And they're great to see. So. Yeah, that's that's a simple, easy question. People, awesome. People, that's all. <laughs> and, and you're absolutely right because you know I still stay in touch with many of the people that I flew with, and it's when you run into them, it's like you restart the conversation where it stopped. Exactly. Like, you know that decade or two didn't really matter because that shared experience and what you said it it is the people, it is that camaraderie that you really just don't get anywhere else in life. So, and, and, and I tell you, you know, I, I, as I'm watching my son and my daughter and my nieces and my nephews and, and my cousin's kids go off to school and watching what they're doing, and, and a lot of them are doing great things. You know, so-and-so is going to be a doctor, so-and-so is going to be a CPA, so-and-so is mm -hmm. going to do this. But it's, it's, the, it's the few, the very few that are like one of my cousin's kids is going off to Marine, you know, platoon leadership. He's going to be a Marine officer. I mean, I, he's going off to do some great things. My son, he's going to go off to be hopefully a, a, you know, an Air Force aviator or Naval aviator. He's going to, I, mean, I just, I'm so excited. And so, you know, those guys are going to have such a great, guys and girls are going to have such a great career in front of them. They're going to, you know, they're not going to be rich. They're not going to be Microsoft millionaires, but they are going to be much richer here having known the people and having the experiences that they've known. And I can't think of a better way. As a matter of fact, I would trade 
I would trade everything I have right now, including my dog, to be with in the seats, to be at one of the you young cadets and to be starting off all over again because I just I would love to be in your shoes, to be be where you are right now. Great time, great place. Well, sir, since you've actually levied up your dog, <laughs> your level of commitment with this. So I totally get it. So Captain Christie, thank you very much for being part of our program. Truly uh, appreciate your insights and the background that you've given. Uh, cadets, I certainly hope that you've received a whole bunch of things to think about. And then also for those of you who are in the Northwest region, you've actually had a great opportunity to know your national headquarters rep just a little bit more. So when you get to meet him out in the field when he's visiting, you know, you have a start of that conversation. So, you know, you know, this should be required viewing for everybody in your region, sir. If it's great. not, you know, make it happen, sir. Make it happen. So that, you know, they get that ex that experience and they, you know, they, they get to relate to you on a personal level, not, you know, just, you know, the title. So right. thank you very exactly. much, sir. Truly appreciate it. And, and cadets, again, if you're watching the recorded view, which many of you are, you know, ask the questions, put them in the comment section of the archived version, and we'll absolutely get back to you. So thank you very much. Uh, also, too, there will be that online quiz. It's 10 questions. The majority of it, it was covered during this presentation. If it's not, Google it. You know how to use that. You'll be fine. No big deal. Uh, and take your time. Fill out the right email addresses so you get your responses back. So on behalf of myself, uh, on MC1 Quinlan, SDG1 Lewison, and Ensign DePippo, Thank you very much for joining us this evening, and we look forward for you joining us next time for another episode of Real Sailors, Real Sea Stories. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.